So this is our second uh, Heart to Heart, and I really appreciate everybody uh, tuning in on a uh, hot summer night. Thank you to everyone for joining us. I'm Abley Wilson, as you know, president of the American College of Cardiology, and I have several great guests to be here with us this evening on this important topic. This is our second installment of the Heart to Heart Presidential Series discussion. And tonight we'll be discussing restrictive covenants and the potential risks and benefits of patient care, clinician well-being, and more. So my esteemed guests are Joseph Marine, Nicole Lohr, and Jeff Marshall. They will share their insights and answer any questions you have, as well as we have a strong team from advocacy of ACC that will be with us as well. And so we're excited to welcome you to this conversation. And importantly, we always reserve the last uh, half hour or so to hear your perspectives. And we really like the interchange and we want to make this more, as they say, a conversation or a discussion. So please feel free to enter questions for the panel in the chat box or unmute when called upon during the Q&A period. And if you're on social media, share your takeaways using the hashtag ACC President and also tag at ACC in touch. I also want to remind you that this session is being recorded and this recording will be on YouTube shortly after the event in case you want to review it. So now, um, thanks once again for joining. I think we have more people coming on board uh, minute by minute. So my first guest of the three is Dr. Joseph Marine. He is the ACC Membership Committee Chair and member of ACC's Board of Trustees. He's a clinical cardiac electrophysiologist at the John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. He is a professor of medicine at Johns Hopkins and holds appointments as Vice Director of the Division of Cardiology and Section Chief of Cardiology for Johns Hopkins Community Physicians. Welcome, Joe. Dr. Marine. Thank you, Hadley. Great to be with you, and thank you for uh, highlighting this very important topic. My other guest is uh, Dr. Nicole Lohr, who is ACC's Secretary on the College's Board of Trustees and Chair of the Board of Governors. She is Associate Professor of the Division of Cardiovascular Medicine at the Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And now, actually, <laughs> sorry, Nicole, um, but uh, actually you're now, I think, Chair of the Department of uh, the Cardiology Division at the University of Alabama. So I, I apologize that we have this a little bit out of date here. But uh, Dr. Lohr is a physician scientist serving as principal investigator for numerous active clinical trials. Uh, welcome, Nicole, and please uh, correct uh, my um, incorrect introduction. Can you go ahead and just introduce yourself and let us know your, your current title beyond being probably, to me, one of the most important, being the chair of the Board of Governors. Nicole? Well, honestly, being the chair of the Board of Governors probably is the most important, um, but I have a wonderful day job as the division director at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And like um, Andy Miller likes to say, from restrictive covenant free Alabama. Um, so um, thanks for inviting me and I look forward to a great discussion. Well, thank you. And um, Obviously, uh, Dr. Lohr has uh, moved up in the past year, uh, going from um, Milwaukee to Birmingham. And my third guest on the uh, panel is uh, Dr. Jeffrey Marshall, Chief of the Northside Hospital Cardiovascular Institute in Atlanta, Georgia. And he is the past governor and president of ACC's Georgia chapter and chair of the recent BOG work group on restrictive covenants. Welcome, Jeff. Thanks, Hadley. Thanks for having us. Uh, I'll echo what uh, uh, Joe said. This is an important issue, and uh, it's got some chicanes in it that hopefully the ACC can help us uh, negotiate. Thanks, Jeff, and all of you. 
So again, welcome to each of you that have joined in this evening, and we'll move right along. I think we've, it's going to be information-packed and also, I think, uh, action-packed. And first, I'm going to call on uh, Dr. Maureen Joe to tell us how this all came about a few years ago when you were chair of the Board of Governors. Sure, Hadley. Um, well, as many in our audience know, restrictive covenants are contract clauses that limit the ability uh, of an individual a physician to engage in uh, the practice of act, uh, certain activities, particularly in our case, the practice of medicine. It's often tied uh, to employment and increasingly uh, physicians and cardiologists are employed by health systems and other entities. It typically has a duration and a scope in terms of uh, area around a practice. There's several components of non of restrictive covenants. They include non-compete clauses, non-solicitation clauses, prohibiting former employees uh, from soliciting patients or other employees to join when they leave a practice and confidentiality. And probably the most concerning uh, for physicians uh, are the non-compete provisions. Uh, and when I was chair of the Board of Governors, and even before this had been raised by a number of governors in their states uh, concerning members and concerning governors themselves uh, who found themselves uh, leaving health systems and in some cases having to move out of state uh, to continue to practice cardiology because of the way uh, some of these non-compete clauses um, are written. So that's kind of how it came about. It rose up uh, through the Board of Governors, through the grassroots membership as an important issue. And so I, when I was chair in 2021, um, I asked Jeff Marshall um, to lead a work group, uh, which consisted of eight other governors, um, as well as uh, Frank Ryan from the ACC uh, State Advocacy Office and two other outside attorneys who work with, uh, with ACC uh, to lead this uh, work group. And they did a, a fantastic job putting together a white paper uh, state by state analysis, and perhaps uh, Jeff can talk uh, a little bit about that further in the broadcast. Thanks, Joe. And we will get to Jeff, um, but now I'm going to uh, turn it over to our A team, as you mentioned, our advocacy team with uh, Nick Morris and Matt Manella to talk about the national overview. And then afterwards, uh, they'll turn it over to Michael Lawrence to talk about uh, state trends. So uh, Nick or Matt, if you'll take it over now, that would be great. Thanks, Dr. Wilson, and thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm gonna just a very quick jog through uh, some dizzying recent history uh, in the federal space uh, as it pertains to uh, non-compete clauses. So all of this activity began uh, federally uh, in July of 2021 when uh, President Biden issued an executive order, an extremely broad executive order uh, to promote competition in the American economy. And so this uh, this triggered the various federal regulatory agencies to begin exploring ways to unleash the American worker, uh, so to speak. So really a very broad ranging uh, document. Uh, subsequently, in January of this year, the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, uh, issued a notice of proposed rulemaking um, that would ban non-competes across the entire scope uh, of American employment, essentially uh, finding that up to 30 million Americans are currently governed by non-compete clauses. That's one in five uh, workers currently. Uh, and so this rule is extremely broad in scope uh, and is really intended to impact anyone um, from cosmetologists uh, to cardiologists. And so uh, that's certainly a very sweeping uh, gesture by the federal government. Now, uh, as is often the case, that's that's not cut and dried by by any set by any uh, standard. So uh, there's going to be uh, certainly uh, potentially infinite legal challenges to this. It's unclear uh, to many if the Federal Trade Commission even has uh, this level of authority to make a rule such as this. Uh, and most importantly, for many of our uh, physicians uh, who work in nonprofit health systems, uh, the the jurisdiction of the Federal Trade Commission over nonprofit entities. Uh, is very much in dispute. Uh, so that's something uh, that will be uh, really important to track. Uh, but the intent of the rule is not only to ban all non-compete clauses uh, going forward, but also to um, negate any existing uh, non-compete clauses that are that are in existence. And so uh, employers would in fact be required to notify their employees that their non-compete clauses are no longer in effect. 
Um, again, uh, I can't say it enough. This, this, it's already been signaled that there will be significant legal challenges uh, when and if a final rule is promulgated. It's currently uh, what in the rulemaking in the federal law space is referred to as a proposed rule. So uh, it's being uh, it's submitting uh, public comments um, from across the landscape, uh, including the ACC, um, on on whether the proposed rule should be uh, eventually finalized and take effect. Uh, the gist of ACC's comments, uh, ultimately, of course, that non-competes are harmful uh, to patient care, disrupt the continuum of care, uh, disrupt patient access, and of course, uh, have a very uh, deleterious effect on uh, physician autonomy and workplace culture. Um, and while there's the possibility that in very limited cases where there's a small, uh, you know, potentially a private practice, um, should some protections be potentially considered, um, you know, that's something that certainly is worthy of discussion. Um, but ultimately, the ACC's comments submitted in April are very supportive of the elimination of non-competes. And I'll, uh, ultimately, while these legal challenges are certain to play out for any number of years, um, the real action, as it's so often in the is the case, uh, will be in the states. Uh, and so with that, I'll turn it over to Mike Lawrence. Uh, thanks, Nick. Um... So, you know, non-compete legislation continues to trend at the state level. Uh, I think, you know, some of that can be attributed to the FTC proposed rule this year. But then again, this has always been a state that is or in, uh, an issue that's been traditionally legislated at the state level. Um, many of the bills this session uh, were geared towards low wage workers, but there also has been a focus on health care as well. Um, you know, several ACC chapters have engaged in these efforts and are in these much many of these are still ongoing. I'm going to. Uh, give a, a breakdown of the bills that have passed this session and bills that are still pending, starting with the, the legislation that has passed. Um, in Indiana this year, there was a bill introduced that would have banned all physician non-competes. Our Indiana chapter prioritized this bill uh, from the start through a, a grassroots campaign that included testimony, legislative meetings, uh, a lobby day, uh, letter campaigns, et cetera. But uh, ultimately, um, which was kind of signaled, si signaled to us by the medical society, uh, the bill was amended and a compromise was made to prohibit non-competes only for primary care physicians. The language defined primary care uh, to include family medicine, pediatrics, and internal medicine. Uh, the bill ultimately was signed and went into, into uh, effect July 1st. Uh, some noteworthy provisions from the bill, though. Um, you know, it allows employers to buy out their non-competes, uh, and if either party does not agree, uh, it forces mediation. Uh, another key provision is physician non-compete agreements are unenforceable uh, if the employer terminates the physician's employment for cause. Uh, and then also, uh, non-compete agreements are unenforceable if the physician terminates the employment for cause. Uh, a noteworthy development here is um, an Indiana physician recently filed a lawsuit July 5th challenging um, his non-compete based on this last clause in the bill uh, that the physician terminates their employment for cause. The bill itself did not define or set parameters on physician terminating employment for cause. So ultimately um, a lawsuit was filed um, and you know it, it's still kind of to be determined here whether this ultimately could expand the scope of the bill or, or limit it. Uh, I'm going to include a, uh, an article here in the chat box uh, that kind of details this a little further. Um, uh, it's, it's pretty interesting stuff. Moving on, uh, in Minnesota this year, um, a bill passed, uh, a comprehensive bill uh, banning non-competes, uh, defining uh, all employers from using or prohibiting employers from using non-competes in all newly signaled employment contracts, including physician employment contracts. Uh, so a very comprehensive bill, um, you know, it, it does not ban non-competes retroactively, so it only pertains to new contracts, but this is a, uh, this was a, a, an effort that the Minnesota chapter, you know, worked really closely with a lot of stakeholders, including the medical association for several years and prioritized this. So we were happy to, uh, to finally get this one across the goal line. Um, also, in Connecticut this year, uh, legislation passed aiming at improving a physician non-compete law that was already on the books, um, while also adding APRNs and PAs uh, to the law uh, as well. Um, 
this is not a comprehensive ban, but rather a set of limitations on healthcare employers that use non-competes. Um, our team can provide, you know, a more thorough analysis of, of this um, piece of legislation as well as others uh, if, if those are, if, if members are interested. Um, moving on to pending legislation. Uh, so this is primarily in, in the states that, that are more year round legislatures. Um, so New York is a big one. A bill in New York has passed both chambers. Uh, but it's not yet been delivered to Governor Hochul uh, for her signature. If this bill is signed into law, it will be the farthest reaching non-compete uh, in the U.S. It's a total near ban on all non-compete non agreements across pretty much every industry. Uh, the New York ACC has been working really, really hard at this, uh, you know, trying to get the bill to Governor Hochul's desk while also urging her to sign the bill once it does uh, make it to her desk. Um, once the bill does get to Governor Hochul's desk, she'll have 30 days to act. If she doesn't act, it will then be considered a pocket veto. Um, so we certainly don't want that to happen. So we're kind of putting the full court press on um, in New York right now, and our, our chapter's doing a great job. Um, uh, two other bills that uh, actually were just introduced uh, over the last two months, a bill in Ohio. Um, this bill, uh, which is interesting, uh, bans non-competes for healthcare professionals that work for nonprofit hospitals. It includes physicians, PAs, and APRNs in the bill. And then in Michigan, a bill was introduced uh, very similar to their neighbor, Minnesota, uh, a very comprehensive bill. Both these bills are, are early, uh, you know, just newly introduced, haven't even been, um, you know, set for committee. So uh, our team is is working and tracking uh, these bills and uh, working with chapters to help uh, engage lawmakers and, and push them forward. So that's kind of a, a, an overview of, of state legislative activity around non-competes. Thanks, Michael. That's uh, really thorough. I really appreciate it. And I'm sure there'll be some questions, particularly if uh, there are participants from any of those states uh, or maybe have questions about their own state. Uh, you know, you've got this expert panel to help you with that uh, towards the end of this uh, session. So now I'm going to turn to uh, our other uh, panelists and just ask them also about their experiences. First, I'll talk to Dr. Marshall, and then uh, ask to sort of the state of the BOG as far as uh, so Jeff, you want to talk about uh, the these? Uh, we've got one now that through Jack Edge with uh, Joe and uh, many other uh, authors that were part of your work group and uh, even a larger uh, tome here that I have before me that uh, is sort of a reference uh, which may uh, go even other places. So you want to talk a little more about uh, your experiences and about the maybe the major salient points from the paper for those of us who haven't uh, read it yet. Yeah, thanks, Hadley. I, I, I'd first like to stress that this really was a grassroots issue, and the grassroots began when the government basically changed the way physicians were reimbursed for in-office payments. Uh, in 2006, 85% of physicians were in private practice, and because of financial pressures on private practitioners, uh, cardiologists were basically forced into becoming uh, employees. And while there was a great rush to do that, I think that physicians uh, lost autonomy when they found themselves under these non-competes. So uh, when Joe was the head of the BOG, uh, we were all hearing stories of doctors that lived in smaller states uh, that were being basically forced out of their state. Uh, because they were subject to rather onerous non-competes. Um, so we put together this work group. Uh, we did a lot of work. And um, I think one of the things that uh, the, the papers uh, and, the, and uh, the, the toolbox will help people with is understanding what there's, what's going on in their state, um, how non-competes uh, really work, and I, then I think understanding that the ACC is a source for people uh, when they're kind of caught in this conundrum. Um, my personal story was I had been in academics for a long time, went into private practice actually in a 
pretty rural area in North Georgia where we were there for about 15 to 17 years and then made a business decision to move. And um, this was right around COVID. And um, while we were really okay, um, we, we weren't able to see our patients where we had practiced and the hospital that we left was really okay. The people that really got hurt in this terrible set of circumstances were our patients. We had 80 and 90 year old patients, you know, driving 50, 60 miles to come see their doctors. And this story, our story, uh, was just kind of a microcosm of what we were hearing uh, around the BOG. Um, and, and, and then Joe had a great idea. We did a survey of all the uh, members of the BOG and I think over 80% of the members of the BOG thought that um, something should be done about this. And so those papers are coming out uh, soon and uh, Jack advances. Uh, and, and, I, and I think they have some important um, information for anybody that's got uh, a restrictive covenant. Thanks, Jeff. And we'll get back to you in a minute. Nicole, you want to tell us about the state of the uh, restrictive covenant um, work group and maybe a BOG toolkit and anything else you want to share with uh, activity related to this this year in the BOG? Thanks, Hadley. Um, I I think Jeff really um, summarized a lot of the sentiment. I remember being um, a governor. I did not participate in the work group, but. Um, for me, when you feel powerless as a physician, um, when you aren't able to um, have the agency to make decisions for your patients and you, you want to find a place where you feel like you can practice in the best environment, uh, I came from a state in Wisconsin where restrictive covenants are, are really wielded pretty heavy handedly and most physicians are employed. And so, um, just from a personal level, seeing this work um, start to evolve and become practical. I remember taking the survey um, and I remember thinking this would be great if this could ever come to fruition. And so here we are in 2023 and I'm now VOG chair and the just um, the focus has changed. It, it, it's changed from the idea of let's collect information and let's um, see what individual states um, and governors think is important to now having a real possibility after the FTC um, comments uh, that maybe I can do something. And so um, I believe there's um, interest in Iowa. Um, there's legislation um, in Iowa that's just starting. I hear a lot from governors of, you know, how do we really do this? And so, the toolkit starts with really uh, a lot of the elements of the, of the white paper and what will be published in Jack. And so we're using our um, social media outlets. I think New York leveraged social media pretty heavily. And the BOG is making itself, I think, available to help governors um, who are interested in trying to move this legislation start to build those statewide coalitions. Thanks, Nicole. So um, I see we've got about 50 in our audience uh, right now, and feel free to put in the chat any question that you have for this uh, expert panel here that we've assembled this evening. And uh, I think, you know, because uh, so many of us were on the BOG, they're able to talk the talk and now show that they can walk the walk. So we have some questions here that uh, I'm going to ask our panel until we get some from the audience here. Um, so, yes, uh, you know, this may be a pretty broad question, but uh, I'm going to turn this to Jeff first and say, what are the, some of the potential benefits of restrictive covenants and what are some of the risks? Well, I think restrictive covenants uh, protect uh, intellectual property of uh, groups uh, and, and they probably protect growth of new groups, which is uh, important. I don't think all restrictive covenants are bad. Um, 
you could imagine um, a small hospital or a small group, let's say, as an example, starting an EP program and investing heavily uh, in uh, a lab and uh, hiring uh, nursing um, personnel that had expertise in EP, and, and they hire an EP position, a physician to come into a new small community. You could see how that investment that the hospital made to improve the care for the patients in that small community really has value. Um, so in, in that regard, uh, you can see how a non-compete could be good, whether that was a hospital and an employed model or whether that was a private practice group. On the other hand, you have multi-state, almost multinational corporations that have tremendous legal power behind them that really don't need protection from non-competes, right? They, they, they can hire people uh, basically willy-nilly, yet they can force physicians um, uh, to, to, to leave communities uh, by, by doing things sometimes that um, make people want to leave. I mean, when you lose autonomy in your job and you really uh, hate going to work every day, you ought to have the freedom to say, you know what, guys, I just like brand A over here, giant healthcare system. I'm going to go over there. In Georgia, no lawyers have non-competes, but every doctor has a non-compete. Tell me, tell me how that's right. Yeah, and uh, in Charlotte, a uh, big banking town, none of the bankers have non-competes. They go from one tower to another over the weekend. It's pretty crazy. So I see uh, we are getting some uh, audience questions here. And uh, the first one I see, I'm just going down the list uh, just from top to bottom. I see Sam. So I am I am going to take a wild guess and believe that's Sam Jones in Chattanooga. <laughs> it is, Adley. Good evening, everyone. I'd just like to a uh, couple of comments and say thank you for bringing this topic up and kudos to to Jeff and Joe for this outstanding uh, white paper that they did uh, along with the BOG. I will say if anyone, if you haven't had a chance to read it, read it not once, but twice. This is an outstanding paper. It goes through the historical aspects of how we came to be in this situation that we're in. And it really does a balanced approach as Jeff just outlined about, you know, are there any indications for, for restrictive covenants? Maybe a few, but the majority of them are not, as Nick Moore said. And I really agree with what Nicole said that so many times we feel like we are powerless. We don't have agency to do this. And this is one more example uh, when people say, what did ACC, what did they ever do for me? Uh, one more example of what ACC actually does and the, what advocacy really has a role. So where Nick Morris and his team does, I think this really gives us a chance to. What I'd like to see though, um, and, and to get an idea is, uh, I think Jeff really outlined it well. It's not always about us and our job. He said, it's the patient. And I think that was what's really important too, is what is the impact on, on the patient? When we've gone to the state legislators and maybe Mike Lawrence knows, has that actually resonated when we say, this is the impact of the patient or what is the things that have actually been able to push it over the line in some of the states? And what has been the major pushback? My guess is it's the hospital lobbying firm saying, you know, we don't, we don't like this. We don't want this to happen. And this is the impact that you feel from us. So maybe we get a, a feedback from Mike Lawrence or from, from Jeff and Joe or from uh, Nicole as they've seen this about what actually works when we go fight for this and what is the major pushback. Um, and as Hadley says, bankers don't have restrictive covenants. I tell you what, who else doesn't have it? Lawyers. Lawyers don't have it. And therefore, you, you know something's up with the game. It's rigged. So, Michael or Matt, uh, you want to care to try and uh, answer Sam's question? Yeah, I, I can. Uh, I can. Uh, I can answer that. So, just from my uh, case study here in in Indiana this year, um, you know, when we went to Indianapolis for the for the legislative day, and, you know, we met with the state medical association. Um, they came in and spoke with us, and you know. They're they're a key ally, uh, as we all know, you know, at the state level, um, and they are kind of like the you know, the house of medicine kind of falls in line, uh, you know, in a lot of times behind them. So they they had members on both sides of the issue, um, which was our first, which was a kind of our first hurdle. 
Um, so they they were a little wishy washy on on support. Uh, they weren't going to oppose it, but they weren't you know jumping in the way you know Indiana ACC was um, until the bill kind of you know some leadership in Indiana decided this was a, a priority, and then they did, um, which ultimately led to that compromise on you know the primary care you know instead of you know all you know banning all physician non competes. Uh, it got amended to just primary care as a, as a compromise, but when the bill made it over to the other chamber is when, you know, the, 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 the hospital lobby, um, the major health systems, they let it kind of, they let it move through uh, the house and then they pounced once they got to the Senate, um, you know, and, and they were hiring lobbyists, um, you know, not just the in-house folks, they were hiring contract lobbyists just to, to fight that bill. Um, so it was a, it was a, a major uphill battle. Um, you know, but like anything, you know, we were able to really um, organize a strong coalition. The medical society got on board and, you know, and decided that incremental progress was better than no progress at all. So, you know, we, we, um, you know, we're, we're ultimately successful there. On the lawyer front, I was just going to yeah. uh, note ahead, that. Matt. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, I uh, I think it was our hack chair, Dr. Van Decker, who brought it up in conversations about this, that the American Bar Association apparently has some guideline that says that, you know, it's like unethical for the attorneys to to sign a non-compete or to agree to that as part of their employment agreement. And um, I think his, you know, impetus was, was, could there be something like that? Now, uh, I believe the stance of the AMA on this issue is, you know, they have a lot of members on both sides. So I don't, I don't know if they're taking a stronger stance, but that that's something I recall. I just want to mention to the question of lawyers. That's uh, that's uh, actually almost humorous, but uh, I, thank you for that information. Um, so I see that uh, Sanjay Law has his hand up, and Nicole has uh, her hand up, and then also uh, I know that Joe recognized George Lindsemeyer in the audience, and uh, I think, jo uh, George, you might have been the match that started some of this, so I don't know if you're available to just comment on it for a minute or two. I think you actually even moved to a different state. Right, yeah. I hope you can hear me. I'm having trouble with my video. I'm actually on vacation using a temporary uh, internet here, but I was a victim of the restrictive covenant clause. Um, I actually had to get my former employer to relax it a bit to practice 45 minutes in another state. And that was just very painful. So um, I think that most of us now work for big companies. Uh, one person changing jobs is not gonna hurt this big company. Uh, uh, we all took an oath to um, share knowledge. So there are no trade secrets in the medical profession and it's just plain un-American. And uh, I had a thought, perhaps we could make this a national issue if there's an ACC member that's facing a restrictive covenant. Maybe we could just pay for the attorney to fight it and maybe fight it on a national level. Well, it's an interesting uh, strategy there, but it's really good to uh, hear from you again. And I know that you've landed on your feet and you're uh, active with ACC and we appreciate it. I look forward to seeing you at Ledge Conference or, or sooner. Um, Sanjay Law, you're on the line. I know that you had a uh, question and you've been sure. very patient. Well, thank you. I, uh, I wanna first thank the entire ACC board for taking up this very important issue, which is very near and dear to my heart. Um, I want to give a shout out to Jeff, my neighbor uh, in Georgia. Uh, hello, Jeff, and thank you for all your efforts. Um, uh, my question is, how do we, if this is an important topic to us, get involved at the ACC and the grassroots level to push this agenda forward of abolishing uh, a non-compete? And what kind of resources does the ACC have available for folks that are in a tough spot because of non-competes from the big 800 pound gorilla that's trying to drive you out of your workplace. I can't hear you Hadley, but since I'm in Georgia, maybe I can at least start that and, and maybe uh, Joe or, or Michael can go on. Am I the only one that can't hear Hadley? No, I couldn't hear Hadley either. I can't either. 
Okay. Well, well, Sanjay, yes, hello. It's 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 good to uh, see you virtually. And um, like I said, uh, lawyers in in Georgia don't have non-competes, so you could be working at Spalding and King one day, and the next day you can move over and work for Morgan for Morgan, Morgan and Morgan or whatever. And uh, my recollection uh, along this journey of writing uh, these articles is that the uh, the American Bar Association ha actually has uh, uh, lines and and speech in there that says it's unethical for a lawyer to sign a non compete. So you have that on one end of the spectrum in Georgia, and on the other end, you have uh, these laws in Georgia where nobody, no physicians uh, in Georgia uh, uh, can get basically get out of a non-compete as long as it's reasonable. And state by state, the distances are, are different. I think in Georgia, uh, I'm proud to say there were actually two authors on these papers, uh, Dr. Arthur Reitman, who um, works at Wellstar, and myself, who currently works uh, in the Northside Hospital System. And I think there is some uh, groundswell of trying to get this done in Georgia, but it is such a state by state issue. And the state legislature in Georgia this year had such turnover uh, that it wasn't really the right time legislatively to do something in Georgia. But we would love to have any and all uh, the, of y'all that are practicing in Georgia help with the Georgia uh, chapter of the ACC. It's a very active group. Uh, we've been active nationally and uh, we've done some things in the state. So uh, give me a call. Um, I'll put my phone number in the chat. Anybody that wants to call me, they can just uh, call me, Sanjay, and we can move from there. Thanks, Jeff. I have your number, I believe. Thanks, Jeff. And Nicole, you, you've been very patient. Uh, let's well, Let's hear what you have to say. A couple of things. I wanted to actually answer part of Sanjay's question. Um, obviously, he's in Georgia, but I think the message can be translated across. Um, if you if you actually look at the map of um, restrictive covenants, I know we've had some movement in a few states, um, but realistically, I think it's over, it's probably close to 35 states that still have some variation of a restrictive covenant. And so that means really if you feel if you're practicing in that state, you need to be reaching out to your governor of the ACC. This is the time now to start really organizing ourselves. Um, I can tell you from a leadership perspective, the work that's been done, um, starting with Joe, continuing th through with Melissa Wood is, is really bolstering. And now with me, we're bolstering our advocacy, state advocacy committees. And, and I see Frank Ryan on there. Hi, Frank, you, you've been a, a great partner with us to start really sending these messages to um, our local legislatures. Um, so anyone on this um, call tonight, if you have a problem, seek your governor and start there. And I can then, just fill, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Joe. I was just going to fill in what's happening in, in Maryland. Um, we also have uh, non-competes, and they're vigorously enforced by the by the four very powerful health systems. Um, we the the uh, MedCi or State Medical Society has formed a work group, which I volunteered uh, to join. So we're having a vigorous discussion. We've just surveyed uh, physicians across Maryland and are processing that survey. There is moderately strong sentiment for doing something to limit um, restrictive covenants because we do have so many employed physicians. Um, in Maryland, so we're slowly working through the process. There is some opposition to change from uh, some private groups, uh, non-cardiology groups, uh, that we're that we're working through. But hopefully, we can get to uh, to a compromise. And that's really the advocacy process. It's working with your uh, chapter and your state medical society and uh, talking amongst each other to try to arrive at uh, compromise positions. And Joe, you've been uh, very uh, good about putting a lot of things in the chat, very helpful. Like you mentioned just recently, uh, uh, 13 states, uh, I think you said, that prohibit uh, restrictive covenants. And I thought one of the best things about the Jack Edge paper and the white paper was this uh, map that uh, you folks put together. Um, I don't know if you want to take much time to explain it, but basically the dark green ones, I believe, are the ones that prohibit restrictive covenants, and then the others have various levels of uh, 
uh, permeability. Um, so I don't know, did, did either of y'all want to talk about that map? I think it's pretty cool and uh, is very, you know, much a central illustration in these, uh, you know, Jack uh, vernacular. Yes, so our, um, our, our expert legal team, uh, including Frank Ryan, created a, a wonderful state-by-state -state analysis uh, with, with web links to each of the relevant laws uh, in every state. So that's in the uh, web link that I gave you uh, in the ACC uh, website. So you can go to that and it's been summarized um, in a, uh, a, the colored map that you showed that shows that 12 and now 13 in green uh, have uh, uh, restrictive covenants more or less prohibited for physicians. About 20 uh, have them with some limitations by common law, which is legal tradition and case law, and another 20 uh, have restrictive covenants governed by some kind of statute. Um, so all that information uh, is available to, to ACC members to start their analysis, and the, the state chapter advocacy office can help with that as well. Great. So I see some other uh, ACC luminaries in the audience, uh, so you can't hide. I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Andy Miller a question. Um, how do we educate our FITs? How does Alabama educate their FITs about uh, contracting and restrictive covenants and you know what they might be getting into at their state chapter meetings? Or if not Alabama, if someone else wants to chime in after Andy, that'd be great. Uh, thanks, Hadley. So, um, you know, in Alabama, we won by tagging along with the uh, lawyers. The uh, lawyers, I think a couple decades ago, put something in our, I think it's in our state constitution even, that uh, restricted covenants were uh, outlawed and for the professions. And the professions in Alabama are preachers, teachers, lawyers, and doctors. And they did that because the only way to get the lawyers through was to bring those other professions along. Uh, and that's worked really well. And I, in our experience here, I don't think anyone misses restrictive covenants. You know, I think we're all pretty happy that we don't have them. So um, I, I, I've had a hard time seeing the pro on the restrictive covenants. I think it's it's a pretty small group, and it really needs to be geographically uh, reduced. Now, as far as getting involved in advocacy as a fit, um, we need to get all of our young members really involved. And I, I have the the Heart Pack logo behind me. So a good way to get involved is give to the Heart Pack and, and join us at the legislative conference. And I think any young member who goes to the legislative conference gets fired up about this, will see a lot of value in the college. Uh, so I think it's, it's to just put your foot out there and, and get involved. And I think we do have some FIT or EC members uh, here in the audience. I saw a leader here um, that might be able to add some, some input on, on how to get involved. So while they're uh, getting to raise their hand, I'm going to call on the future BOG uh, chair, Emma Vadula. I just recently moved, if you don't mind me saying, from New York to Pennsylvania. I don't know if with that. Uh, just between the two states, I know New York, uh, as Michael said, Lost you, Hadley. Um, hi, Did Hadley. you lose me? I, I think I heard most of your comment. Um, um, I think, and please correct me if, uh, if I'm wrong, but I think you were just wondering about the differences between New York and Pennsylvania. I have a non-compete in my current contract, so I knew at least as of when I signed this contract in the fall of last year, there, there, there was a non-compete. Um, but I don't know if any of the ACC, um, national ACC leaders like Frank Ryan, if, if you have anything more to add on the differences. Yes, we should hear from Frank. You're on mute, Frank. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, so you know, the, in New York right now, we have uh, it's a pretty aggressive bill um, and there's not a lot of uh, exceptions that, you know, the, they have the basic receptions just for you know, reasonableness and the, the um, 
bill is uh, was it, it covers everybody, um, and just like the FTC, you know, uh, effort. But this this legislation covers everybody, and it it um, it passed the legislature both both chambers pretty well, pretty strongly, and so we're working now to get make sure the governor signs it because she doesn't really have any opportunity at this point to change the bill um and which is probably good for us because it would be hard it would be hard to change it um you know to jump in line in front of you know blue collar workers to change it it's just unfortunate that way they but it's but we don't have to worry about that so the chapter has done a really good job just getting out there and you know we're, we've been working with the sponsor of the bill and you know it's, it's a real you know it's it's one of those things where you got to do every little thing possible make sure you thank every single person that was involved in it you know all the way through and um but we're i, I believe that bill doesn't have is not retroactive um that that's something we really in the future like to like to change it's it's probably you know it's going to be a difficult thing to do and that's Again, that's something that people will challenge in the courts, but um, New York, I would say their bill is is the most um, the most aggressive. Um, you know, Connecticut has a very uh, pretty strong bill that they did a compromise on in 2016, but they jumped in this year and they added some the more you know pro position uh, um, provisions to it that. Um, make it harder to sort of trap somebody in a, in a non-compete, and um, and they also uh, and but they did that without giving up anything they had previously. Um, so that's a really they're they're a very strong state that way. But I want to just um, kind of reiterate what Mike said in the chat is that we're we're available to help any chapter do this. We have a lot of great resources. Um, at at our disposal, the AMA just came up with a. I just got this yesterday. They have this. Um, they call it legislative template, and they have a lot of resources that talk about every, every single state's or good or bad their non compete bills or laws. And um, for the AMA, in the last year or so, um, they're not real crazy about the the FTC being involved in this. But they're very much they've they've their position on non competes has has definitely strengthened towards you know getting rid of them in the last year. I think the the rank and file members at the AMA really brought a, a you know they, they they did this at the last meeting and they you know there's a strong resolution and so that's that's something that's going to change. But it had so much so many problems with the FTC and so many other areas that. You know their their comments are sort of interesting that way. They thank them for doing it, but they were they want to just leave it in the hands of the states. So I can answer any question. Thank you, Frank. Appreciate that. Um, we've got several that want to say some uh, last words here before we uh, you know come down into the home stretch. I'm going to call on our vice president, uh, Kathy Bega, to give us her experiences. And then after that, uh, we'll go to Nicole and then Jeff. And then maybe uh, a word from Dr. Chagas, uh, Antonio Chagas, who's chair of the Assembly of International Governors, and uh, just told us as we were coming on that uh, they're starting to experience this even down in Brazil. So uh, Kathy and Nicole and Jeff and Antonio, and then we'll uh, come to the uh, final toast. Hey, thanks so much, Hadley, and good evening to everybody. What a critical topic for uh, our members. I, I can't really add to the excellent panel and the ACC resources. The only thing in my uh, typical administrative approach would be a word of caution. Make sure that you know what's in your contracts, especially as health systems get larger and larger. So one of the things that I continue to see fellows and physicians who are moving about fail to recognize is signing a restrictive covenant in your contract that is a blanket 5 10 15 20 miles whatever it is as opposed to where you predominantly do your work or better yet 
where 80% or more of your work is done. So it's a much shorter radius for that restriction is a, a very important element that you'd want to consider. There shouldn't be any reason why you would not be able to negotiate that. So just be careful as these systems get larger and larger. And with that, if there's anything we can ever help you answer um, in this area, feel free to ask and let us know. Thanks, Kathy. Nicole? Thank you, Hadley. Um, the question that I had was um, was largely around, you know, how do we kind of sustain momentum? So we see incremental wins. I think this is probably best directed maybe to Michael um, and Frank in the state advocacy. You know, here we are. Okay, primary care gets the non-compete, but we're cardiologists and we still have the non-compete. You know, how do we maintain momentum or kind of start over now where, you know, legislators have recent, recently acted, you know, is there a fatigue? How do we overcome that? You know, I, I think it's one of those, it's one of those things. I mean, you know, similar to prior authorization reform, uh, you know, it, it takes, it takes years, you know, it takes, you know, and you got to view maybe, especially at the state level where it doesn't usually take as long. But something like that, that is a sweeping change, that is kind of major progress in Indiana. Um, sometimes you can just say having a meeting with leadership. Um, you know, I, I think it's it's important to really more than anything. Um, you know, I, I was in I was walking the halls in, in Tennessee with a member um, earlier this year, and we weren't talking about non competes. It wasn't one of the priorities, but that was something that was near and dear to his heart. Um, you know, because he couldn't practice in the community where he went to church, raised his family, you know, was a little league coach and it really affected him. He had to drive 45 minutes away and just to see him tell the legislators that that story, that personal story, it resonated with every single lawmaker we met that day. Um, so I think storytelling is huge here and leading leading with the patient, not necessarily yourself first it, it will will certainly move us forward to to making this happen at the state level i think we just got to keep on it um you know incremental uh change is good uh you know and we just need to um you know continue yeah as we're in a workforce crisis um this is a huge issue i mean and i think of disadvantaged rural areas and you know kathy made great points Sometimes you're locked into large systems and you have no place to go. It doesn't really incite people in, or incentivize people to practice in some of those areas. Yeah, I, I'd just like to real quick just, um, you know, talk about what Mike said that's spot on. That's really important because when you can feature the patient at the, before the legislature, it, it means everything. And, you know, we did this in imaging in California several years ago, and you know, it was radiology against about eight other groups. And we were able to prevail because we had patients that were brought in by cardiologists and neurologists and others. That, and, and the radiologists just had the radiologists and that was, and that was it. So it really means something um, that the legislators that really opens their eyes to see that they're not used to that. So, thanks, Frank and uh, Jeff. Did you want to say some a few words? And we have some others that are still trying to get in. So go ahead, sir. I'll just make this real quick. I think that uh, kudos to the states that have made such great progress. But the question really is, how do you get a uh, uh, a very complex medical society, which really is the rubber meeting the road in most states. How do you motivate them, number one? And number two, are there other societies, uh, non-cardiovascular, that are also interested in changing non-competes that we can typically maybe work with, uh, Mike or Frank? You know, I, I think, you know, I think that the medical societies are starting to come around. I mean, you know, certainly, um, you know, there's there's other groups, uh, other specialty organizations uh, that, you know, we work closely with our colleagues in the state government affairs world um, that uh, that are also looking to kind of get engaged on the on this issue. I think the FTC 
proposed rule really rose awareness, you know? Uh, so, um, Frank, I don't know if you have anything more to add on potential allies, um, but I, I do see, you know, with the AMA kind of starting to turn, I, I think that will trickle down to state medical societies as well. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. You see, like Dr. Smalley in Minnesota, I mean, you have to first start with who do you got to convince to get to join you with the legislature? And he worked on the state medical society for a couple of years. Once they had that, it moved through and they passed the law this year. Good. Okay. Uh, Dr. Like Chagas. Yes. Go ahead, Antonio. What's going on in Brazil? Yes. Thank you for having me. It's a privilege to talk with so many friends and uh, congratulations for the talks. Uh, in Brazil, we are having the same change. We used to be private professionals, and now uh, the new generations become to have employer of big uh, organizations. It's a big change in our way, and our salaries, and also in our income. And it looks like that this transformation is going very fast here in Brazil. Thank you for those insights. We appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in. And I saw Newton Wiggins was on the line and had some very valuable uh, information uh, that you were putting in the chat. Newton, do you want to say something? Yes. Uh, thanks, Dr. Wilson. Uh, and it's really encouraging. I'm an early career, and it's just really encouraging to see all the progress that's been made in this area. So thanks to all of you for working on this. 50% uh, of early careers change jobs within two years of coming out of training. So this is hugely important to our members. And the one thing I put in the chat is, uh, you know, ACC does have a law firm uh, as part of member benefits and it's called contract diagnostics. And so I think this would be a great resource for fellows in training. I put the link uh, on the chat box. I actually used them before they were the ACC preferred law firm and I had a very positive experience. I work with a guy named John Apino and he's really wonderful. Uh, we're doing more um, within our early career section to educate people about this rapidly changing topic. So uh, that's really what I wanted to say for all of the, those who are mentoring fellows. This is a complex area. I think we've seen that, um, but lawyers really provide a good service in this area for your fellows. That was great, Newton. I really appreciated hearing about that. And I, I know that's going to be valuable for our uh, fits and our early careers. So uh, we've got about a minute each left. I'm going to let my distinguished panelists uh, say any final words. Uh, I'll start with Nicole. Thanks, Hadley. Um, I just want to encourage all of you on this call that if you have um, if you have interest in your state, reach out to your governors. Um, the ACC is here to help and here to push this forward. Um, we are in this together and we need to empower each other um, to make re real change. Thanks, Nicole. Appreciate it. Jeff, final word. I would just say that uh, your board of governors works for you. Uh, those are the elected people in the American College of Cardiology. And this was truly a grassroots thing. And um, we can make things happen if we work together. And then finally, what makes that work is having an active PAC that gets our members to the door. PAC money is not uh, red, it's not blue, it's purple. It just gets us through the door to talk to some of these important legislators. Excellent. Joe, final word? Well, thanks Hadley again for uh, highlighting this important talk. It's just been so gratifying to see this uh, rise from a member concern uh, to the Board of Governors uh, and to see so many resources when the ACC galvanized and it just shows how powerful uh, we can be as a cardiovascular community. Thanks, Joe. I really appreciate uh, all of you on the panel and uh, particularly also our uh, strong ACC advocacy team. And I, I think the bottom line of all this is if you have a question, we should have a resource to help you answer that. So now we have our final minute and in this heart to heart um, series, if you're not familiar with this before, at the end, since we're having an evening uh, meeting, uh, we ask you to raise uh, your glass.
with whatever is your favorite beverage. Uh, there we go. We've got some glasses coming up. And um, I think uh, Jeff might be in a Turkish prison or something, but uh, <laughs> looks good. So uh, I'll toast all of you all heart to heart. And thank you for being with us this evening and look forward to our next gathering here in another couple of months. Have a great evening and a great week and stay cool to you.